I'm like, I started seeing the pumpkins, but they came out in July. So I'm like, that's, that's normal. And now I see Christmas decorations going up. So anyway, so we're so glad you could join with us this morning. If you're a visitor with us, if you could look in the pew there in front of you, there should be a, a yellow card. If you could fill that out, it gets us, gives us an opportunity to get to know you better and get, you can get to know us a little bit better. Um, I also like to tell you that there are Sunday school classes that go on before this service for every age. I think last week, uh, what did she say? I can't remember what she said, but in the choir I heard them say there are classes for the little, the middle, and the brittle. <laughs> so I think that works out pretty good. So there is, a, there is a level of education here for everyone, wherever you are in your Christian walk, that it gives us an opportunity to follow the people in front of us, to pull the people behind us so we can all get to where we need to be in our faith. i also like to remind you that this is the first Sunday of the month, so uh, this basket will come around. We put cash donations in for Bread of Life. Pooling our money together, we can do a lot more than just bringing in a can of corn or a can of beans or something like that. So that works out really well for us. Next Sunday, we're going to have a ministry fair. Uh, there won't be any rides, but there will be people sitting there talking about all the different events that we do here in the church, um, whether you want to find out about being a liturgist, an usher, someone who works in the booth, uh, the choir, volunteering with the kids. It's really an opportunity to ask people about what are my gifts and how can I utilize my gifts to grow in my faith. Um, I don't have any other announcements. Our pastor and preacher this morning is still Jesse Hill.
Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 8. Please join with me responsibly in our call to worship. O Lord, our Lord, how exalted is your name in all the world. You have set up a stronghold against your adversaries to quell the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in place, all the heavens. What are human beings that you should be mindful of them? Mortals that you should seek them out? You give them uh, mastery over the works of your hands. You put all things under their feet. All sheep and oxen, even the wild beasts of the field. The birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever walks in the paths of the sea. The Lord, O Lord, how exalted is your name in all the world. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you today as your beloved people, as your children. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified by the words of our lips, by the thoughts of our minds, by the things that we love in the deepest parts of our hearts. Lord, be glorified in our midst today. Lord, we pray that today as we hear your word, as we respond to you in prayer and in song, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Lord, we pray that you would be lifted high and that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you would be at work inside of us, changing us from the inside out, making this a congregation of people who know how to rejoice in who you are and in who you are making us to be. Lord, that you would change us from the inside out to be more and more like your Son. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand. In God's grace, please join with me in our prayer of confession, followed by a moment of quiet reflection and prayer. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For 
the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. John writes, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. My friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Time for the kids to come forward.
Okay, so my question for you all today is, what is the best meal you ever had? Eden? What do you think is the best meal you ever had? Okay, what about, what's your favorite food, your favorite thing to eat? Uh, my favorite food is to eat bagels. Bagels. That's a surprising choice. That's pretty good. That's awesome. Mac and cheese and ramen. Mac and cheese and ramen. Okay. That's pretty good. Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. Okay. Hi on the starch here. That's good. Anybody else? Favorite food? Nobody said ice cream? Okay. Okay. Well, here's something that we're going to be talking about with the grown-ups later, which is that eating food, eating really good food, is always a gift from God. When we eat good things, that's a gift from God. Did you know that Jesus spent most of his time in the Gospels going to people's houses for dinner? He loved having good food with people. And every time he did, we read about him, you know, he breaks the bread and gives it to people and this kind of thing. He always gives thanks for the food. Do you guys, when you eat at home, do you pray before you eat or say grace or something like that? Yeah? Sometimes? Yeah. Not always? Okay. But probably it is happening and you may not be paying attention. That's my, that's my best guess. We give thanks to God when we eat good food because we know that good food is a gift from God. It's a gift of life, really, is a gift from God. The whole world that God made is, is a gift from God. And food is a part of that. And so we give thanks when we eat good food because we're grateful to God. And really, if you have your friends over and you make your favorite food and you have macaroni and cheese or bagels or whatever you're going to have, that's a way that you are bringing somebody else into giving thanks with you. You're saying, this is good. We are enjoying this. And a part of being a Christian is just enjoying the good things that God made. So that's what we're going to be talking about with the grown-ups today. But when you pray before dinner... It's not just about taking a moment to be quiet before you get to eat. It's not just about good manners. It's about we're thanking God for the good things that he has given us. So you guys can do that. And sometimes in my house, maybe you do this at home too. Different people will pray. Sometimes Eden prays before we eat. So if it's your turn to pray, if your family does something like that, make sure you thank God for the good food and for the good life that he gave you, okay? All right, I'm going to pray for you guys, and then you're going to go off to kids' church. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for these kids and their presence in our lives, for the gift that they are. And we pray that as they go out to, to their classes today, to kids' church, Lord, we pray that they would be aware that, that you are good, that you have put good things into their lives, that you have put good teachers into their lives. And Lord, we pray that you would help them to be thankful to you, just as we are all thankful to you for their presence in our lives. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've got a couple scripture readings this morning. The first one is from the Old Testament. It's from Isaiah 25, 6 through 10. And there is an element in this scripture that echoes and expands a little bit of what's in the book of Revelation. And what this little verse here, it really is one of hope, salvation, and restoration. It speaks of God's triumph over death and suffering and his provision for all people and that the joy that will come when he establishes his kingdom fully. 
So here's Isaiah 25, 6 through 10. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. The Moabites shall be trodden down, and their place as straw is trodden down in the dung pit. Our next two verses, or next two scripture readings, come from the book of Luke. When we add these two passages from Luke, we can see how inclusive God's kingdom is and the challenges that it has in both our society and in our religious norms underlying God's grace and the transforming power of the gospel. Luke 5, 27 through 39. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the religious, but sinners to repentance. Then they said to him, John's disciples, like the disciples of the Pharisees, frequently fast and pray, but your disciples eat and drink. Jesus said to them, you cannot make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it to an old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine in an old wineskin. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one, after drinking old wine, desires new wine, but says the old is good. Our second is from Luke 14, verses 7 through 14. When he noticed how the guests chose the place of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, Give this person your place, and then in disgrace you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He, he said also to the one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, I talked about the idea that all of us are disciples of Jesus and how a good way for us to think about discipleship today is, is thinking of it like apprenticeship. We are apprenticed to Jesus, and that means we're learning to be like him and to do the things that he does. 
An apprentice of Jesus doesn't just believe certain things about Jesus. An apprentice to Jesus is learning to do things like Jesus. For the first disciples, this meant that they traveled around with Jesus. They followed wherever he went, and they learned to do the things that he did. For us as modern disciples, it means that we follow his lead. It means when we open up the Bible and read about the things that Jesus did and the things that he taught, We try to put those things into practice in our lives. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about some of the things that we do as disciples or apprentices of Jesus and how we can put those things into practice today. And today we're talking about feasting like Jesus. Now, feasting might seem like a kind of a strange place to begin when we're talking about discipleship. But feasting is one of the things that Jesus did the most. Sometimes people think of what Jesus must have been like during his time on earth, and they imagine him like one of those religious mystics you see on TV in some strange part of the world, and they've got this you know, otherworldly look in their eyes. It's like they're mentally someplace else, and they're gaunt and pale because they prefer spiritual food to anything this world might have to offer. And that seems to be a little bit what John the Baptist was like at times. He was a pretty strange character. And and Jesus gets into this debate with the Pharisees in Luke chapter 7. And he said, John the Baptist came eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say he has a demon. But then Jesus says this about himself. He says, the son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You can't win with the Pharisees. They don't like it either way. But Jesus says, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. That's how he describes himself. And it it matters that Jesus describes himself this way. And and I've counted at least three ways that this really matters when we think about Jesus. First, it matters that he comes eating and drinking because it means that he really did come in the flesh. He lived a real, incarnate, human life. He was not a ghost or a spirit or an apparition. He was a real human person with a real body that needed to eat and drink and sleep and all of those kinds of things. Second, it means that Jesus was eating and drinking with other people. It tells us about the kind of company that he chose to have. So much so that the Pharisees tried to insult him and discredit him. They said he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, for once, the Pharisees get something right. Aren't you glad Jesus is the friend of sinners? If he wasn't, there would be no hope for any of us. Third, Jesus comes eating and drinking because he is inaugurating a new kind of kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And this is a kingdom that can be described as being a feast, a feast that is shared by God and by his beloved people. We read about this a little bit in Isaiah. We'll come back to that in a moment. Jesus is about feasting. Quite a few scholars have noticed that in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is always on his way to a dinner or at a dinner or on his way from a dinner. And it's not just Luke. There are a lot of food references in the Gospels in general. Food is a big deal for Jesus. When Jesus is out in the wilderness fasting, Satan tries to tempt him. And the first temptation that Satan brings is food. He tries to tempt him with food. Why? Because Jesus was hungry. He wanted to eat. He liked food. In in a similar way, after the resurrection, we see Jesus appearing multiple times in the Gospels to his disciples. And each time we find him eating. In John 21, they find him on the shore of the lake, cooking fish over a charcoal fire. In Luke 24, he appears two times. And the first time, the disciples don't recognize him until the moment that he breaks bread and gives it to them. The second time, they do recognize him, but they think he's a ghost or a spirit or something until he asks if they have anything to eat. Both times, they recognize that it's really Jesus when they see him eating. because That's a familiar sight. That's how they know him, eating. Did you know there are only two miracles that are recorded in all four of the Gospels? Each Gospel writer has their own things that they put in into the gospel, but there are two miracles recorded in all four gospels. The first is the resurrection of Jesus, which makes sense. But the second one 
is the feeding of the 5,000. That's the only other miracle that's in all four Gospels. Why would the Gospel writers decide, of all the things they could write, this is something that all four of them said, this has to be in here. People have to know that Jesus did this, that he miraculously fed 5,000 people with a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread. It's an account that tells us something about who Jesus is. It tells us that he cares about the real human bodies of the people who follow him. He cares that they're hungry, that they won't be able to keep going if they don't get something to eat. And so he feeds them. But not only does he feed them, he gives them so much extra that there are 12 baskets of food left over after everyone had their fill. This is a miracle that does not just give people enough to get by. It's a miracle that shows the extravagance and abundance of the Lord. To our modern sensibilities, the feeding of the 5,000 seems inefficient, overindulgent, maybe even wasteful. But it's a sign of abundance, that there is more than enough. And it's a sign of celebration. It's a feast. It shows us something about the extravagance of God and of his kingdom. Jesus cares about food. And not just food that's enough to get by. He cares about feasting. And it's not just that Jesus was hungry and and liked the taste of food. Eating together with others is a big part of this. The company matters as much as the food, and so Jesus makes it a priority to eat together with people he cares about. In the Gospels, we read that he eats with his friends, Mary and Martha. He eats with the religious leaders, the Pharisees. He eats with gluttons and drunkards. He eats with women who have bad reputations, and of course, he eats a lot with his disciples. It's a notable thing that the way Jesus told his disciples to remember him was to break bread together. Jesus is remembered and experienced and anticipated in the Lord's Supper, which we're going to celebrate shortly. The fact that Jesus does this is not all that surprising. Feasting is a major theme in Scripture, also in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we read a lot about feasting, and feasting is always a way of giving thanks to God for his salvation, for his creation, for all of the good things that God does. Our reading this morning from Isaiah 25 paints a picture of a day when God himself will provide an incredible feast, the best food, the best wine. It says, for all peoples to enjoy, for all peoples to enjoy in his presence. This is a scene where death has been destroyed, where God himself has wiped away every tear, where the people eat and drink at total peace with God and with each other. And so they are giving thanks, they are rejoicing in God's salvation. What Isaiah describes in Isaiah 25 is really the ultimate fulfillment of all of the Old Testament feasts. In the law of Moses, there are seven feasts described where the people were required by law to celebrate these seven different feasts, to put their work aside and to prepare extravagant meals to share with their neighbors as an act of thanksgiving to the Lord. And so they give thanks for the harvest and they give thanks for God's word. They give thanks for God's deliverance of their ancestors at the Passover and through the Exodus. Even the Sabbath day is a kind of feast of thanksgiving, where we cease from work and give thanks for what God has done in making the world. If any of you have ever been invited to or or do get invited to celebrate the Passover or the Sabbath in a traditional Jewish home, you will hear this ancient prayer that people have been praying for thousands of years. It goes like this. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohenu Melech Haolam Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz. It means, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. It recognizes that everything about our lives, everything about creation, even down to this small loaf of bread, is an incredible gift from God. And then they pray the same prayer and they give thanks for the wine. Baruch Kata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Bori Pri Hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe who creates the fruit of the vine. Eating the bread, drinking the wine are ways of receiving the good gifts of God's creation, but also of giving thanks for that creation. Feasting in the Old Testament is a way of giving thanks for the good gifts that God has given us. And in A part of the way that we give thanks is by sharing these same gifts with others. 
In Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the instructions for the, the feasts and the law of Moses are often paired with an instruction to remember the poor, to remember the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner at these feasts. And so we give thanks to God for his good gifts by celebrating and sharing with others. That's what Jesus is doing when he goes to dinner at all of these different people's houses. It's an act of gratitude, a celebration of God's goodness. That's why we say that we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And it seems that Jesus is not short on things to celebrate. Notice in our reading from Luke chapter 5 that celebration and thanksgiving are the motivation for the, for the party that is happening there, for the feast that happens there. In Luke chapter 5, Levi is inviting Levi, or sorry, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus is inviting Levi to follow him. And immediately, Levi leaves his work behind, just like we heard about last week with the four fishermen. He leaves his work behind so he can go and follow Jesus. And Levi obviously thinks this is worth celebrating. And so he throws a huge party. He wants to give thanks and invite others to celebrate with him what, that he has been called to follow Jesus. Now the Pharisees, they're bothered by all of this. They're bothered by this celebration and this feasting. They think Jesus should fit their idea of a religious leader, that he should be serious and solemn all the time, never stooping so low as to eat and drink with ordinary people. And so they say to Jesus in Luke chapter 5, verse 33, John's disciples, like the disciples of the Pharisees, frequently fast and pray, but your disciples eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. Jesus is saying here, Levi has it right. He's doing the right thing. He wants to throw a party, put on a huge banquet, because now he is following Jesus, and that's worth celebrating. Jesus is right there with him. It's like being at a wedding. Fasting is something you do if Jesus is far away, but when he is there with you, you celebrate. Feasting is about giving thanks to God for his work in our, in our world and in our lives. And Levi is doing exactly that. And this is why Jesus gives thanks every time he breaks the bread. But it's also why he's in the habit of feasting with all kinds of people. The Pharisees were bothered by the fact that Jesus ate and drank with tax collectors and sinners. But this is only because they were ignorant about the spirit of generosity of welcome, of inclusion that motivated all of the Old Testament feasts. They forgot that Moses gave his explicit instructions that these feasts should be celebrated together with foreigners, orphans, widows, and everyone else. The Old Testament feasts and the law of Moses were not designed to be a party with an exclusive guest list. They were public celebrations of God's goodness that invited everyone in, perhaps especially the poor and the outsiders. That's why Isaiah says, this is a feast that God gives for all peoples, for all the nations. Everyone is invited. And that's why when we find Jesus feasting, he includes everyone. No one is left out. The Pharisees were angry that Jesus was willing to sit across the table from people they thought weren't worthy of their company. But Jesus warns against this kind of thinking. In our reading from Luke chapter 14, Jesus says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return, and then you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Feasting like Jesus means inviting everyone, especially somebody who cannot return the favor. And the same thing is true when you're a guest at a meal. Jesus says not to choose the most important seat as though you were the guest of honor, but rather sit in the least important place. Feasting like Jesus always involves humility and inclusiveness. And this is why Christians from the very beginning have celebrated the Lord's Supper together as equals. We do not celebrate communion as though some of us were more important than others. Now, sometimes in church history, this has gotten messed up. They've developed some weird practices where some people are treated as though they were more important than others. This is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 about problems happening in the church there in Corinth. 
He says they were celebrating the Lord's Supper together, and some of them were going hungry while others were getting drunk. That's not feasting like Jesus. That's feasting like the rest of the world. When we celebrate communion, we celebrate it as equals, knowing that all of us, regardless of our status in life and in the world, all of us have received grace upon grace from the Lord according to the measure of his kindness, not because any one of us is more or less deserving than anyone else. This is actually why you'll find a lot of churches have potluck lunches. This is a tradition that goes all the way back to the very beginning of the church when they had agape feasts, love feasts. Everyone brings what they're able to share with the whole community. And everyone shares equally in the meal, whether they brought a lot or a little. A few weeks ago, we had a potluck here after the service. And one generous person anonymously provided enough fried chicken for the whole church. Some people brought their favorite homemade dishes. Some people brought nothing. Some people showed up for the first time not even knowing that there was a meal happening. But everyone shared equally in that meal. In fact, there was enough food left over that lots of people brought leftovers home. That's a picture of what the kingdom of heaven is like. Someone brings an excessive amount of something to share. Someone else brings an appetite and nothing more. Everyone gets a seat at the table. But there's more to the story. Jesus keeps all kinds of company when he eats and drinks, not only because he wants to invite everyone into giving thanks and celebrating God's goodness. He does this for another reason as well. Listen again to what we heard a few minutes ago in Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 30. It says, The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus chooses to eat and drink with people who need him. We read in the Gospels that Jesus goes out into the countryside and, and he preaches, calling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Preaching and proclaiming the good news is something that Jesus and his disciples do. We'll get to that in a few weeks. But here we see Jesus has another strategy for calling sinners to repentance. Instead of preaching at them, he sits down at the table with them. In fact, many of the repentance sermons that Jesus preached were directed at the Pharisees and the other religious leaders. But for regular people, ordinary folk, sinners and tax collectors and the like, Jesus chooses often to simply sit down and share a meal with them. And the Pharisees don't get this at all. They say, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? These were the exact kinds of people that the Pharisees were trying to avoid because they were always more concerned about looking righteous than actually living righteously. They were more worried about their reputation than they were about doing the right thing. Jesus doesn't share in that concern. Uh, Rosaria Butterfield writes, the Christians are called to live in the world but not live like the world. Christians are called to dine with sinners, but not to sin with sinners. Either way, when Christians throw their lot in with Jesus, we lose the right to protect our own reputation. Jesus had a bad reputation with the Pharisees because of the people he had dinner with. They called him a glutton and a drunkard because he ate and drank with gluttons and drunkards. Jesus wasn't worried about that. He didn't need to be respectable in their eyes. Annie Dillard writes about being young, and when she was young in grade school, her parents made her read the Gospel of Luke, and she says they thought it would make her more respectable. After she read it, she wondered if they had any idea what was actually written in the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> it didn't make her more respectable. Jesus has a good reason, though, for ruining his own reputation. He chooses to eat and drink with sinners because he has come to call them to repentance. We see another example of the same kind of thing in Luke chapter 19, where Jesus meets Zacchaeus, a wealthy and presumably corrupt tax collector. Everybody knows Zacchaeus now because he was notably a very short man. He couldn't see over the crowds that followed Jesus, and so he climbed up into a sycamore tree to try to get a glimpse. And Jesus sees him up in the sycamore tree and invites himself over for dinner at Zacchaeus' house. And people were upset about this. It was scandalous to be eating with a man like Zacchaeus. Luke writes, people were grumbling about Jesus being the house guest of a sinner, but 
In Luke 19, verse 8, look at what Zacchaeus does. It says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. What is it that led to Zacchaeus choosing to repent of his crooked ways? Luke doesn't record anything about Jesus preaching to Zacchaeus. Instead, it seems that simply being near Jesus, having Jesus in his own home, was enough to call Zacchaeus into a different kind of life. He changes his ways. Back in Luke chapter 5, Jesus tells the Pharisees that he eats with tax collectors and sinners because he has not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There are a lot of things we could learn from this, but for right now, I want you to notice this very basic idea. Feasting like Jesus is a legitimate strategy for evangelism. One of the things that we are called to do as disciples of Jesus is to make more disciples. How does Jesus do that? How does Jesus make disciples? Well, one way is that he sits down for dinner with people. That's something all of us can do. Sometimes people say, I really don't think I'm good at evangelism. I don't know how to share my faith and this kind of thing. Well, do what Jesus did. Have dinner with people. You can do that. A moment ago, I quoted from Rosaria Butterfield. She's a fairly controversial figure in some ways, but she has this book called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And in that book, she tells the story of how she became a Christian after having been adamantly opposed to religion for most of her life. And the story is simple. A Christian couple, it was a pastor and his wife, invited her over for dinner every Friday night for two years. And she went. They were honest about who they were and what they believed, but they never made their differences in belief into an obstacle. They simply welcomed her again and again. And she sat down at the table with them, and bit by bit, piece by piece, every Friday night for two years, the good news about Jesus started to reach her ears and eventually her heart. And she writes about, it's the welcome of these people that made it possible for her to become a Christian. Feasting like Jesus is a legitimate evangelism strategy because feasting is a living picture of the gospel. Remember the scene from Isaiah 25. The restoration, and the, inaugura the restoration of all things, the inauguration of God's kingdom is depicted as a feast where all the nations are gathered together at peace in the presence of God, ex enjoying the full extravagant abundance of what life is meant to be like. We see almost the same scene in Revelation chapter 19 where the culmination of the saving work of Jesus results in this great multitude praising God for his salvation and sitting down at the wedding feast of the Lamb. This is what it looks like when the work of salvation is completed. When God lives among his people and sin and death are destroyed, what is left to do except to praise God and sit down and enjoy the feast? Blessed are those who are invited to join the marriage supper of the Lamb. This means that our potlucks and our Thanksgiving dinners, our neighborhood barbecues, our wedding receptions are all little pictures of what the kingdom of God is like. If you signed up last week for Dinner for Eight, you're doing something that is actually a picture of what the kingdom of God is like. You're proclaiming the good news about Jesus simply by showing up with a dish to share. This is also why the central liturgical practice of the Christian faith all throughout the history of the church is the celebration of the Lord's Supper. In a few minutes, we're going to eat bread and drink wine, or in our case, it's going to be grape juice. This is a meal that looks backward. We're remembering, recalling what Jesus has done for us in giving his own life for the sake of ours. But it's also a meal that looks forward. We are anticipating and hoping for that extravagant feast, the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so we find that even in these little pieces of bread that we have and these little plastic cups of juice, we are sharing in a feast together with the one who was and who is and who is to come. Feasting is an act of hope, and this is most clear when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So, my fellow disciples, 
One of the skills we are learning in our lifelong apprenticeship to Jesus is the art of feasting like Jesus. And when we feast like Jesus, we are imitating him and giving thanks to God for the good gift of food and creation and all that that entails, the good gift of friends, the gift of life itself. Feasting like Jesus will mean welcoming people into our lives, welcoming the stranger, the poor, the immigrant, anyone who is willing to sit at the table with us because we are learning to welcome others as Christ has welcomed us. Feasting like Jesus is an act that proclaims the good news, not only in words, but also in taste and touch and smell. It's an act that says life is good and life is a gift from God and God is not done giving life. It is an act of celebration and invitation and hope all at the same time. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. We respond in our faith and obedience to the giving of our gifts and of ourselves. It was once said that the world asks, what does a man own? Well, Jesus asks, how does he use it?
Let us pray. Gracious God, with thanks we offer the gifts of our hands and the fruits of our labors. Accept them as expressions of our response to the life and the love you have given us. Amen. You may be seated. Will you join me in reciting together the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to be celebrating together the Lord's Supper. If you are a person who has put your faith in Jesus, this table is for you. Each of us is invited to celebrate together the gifts of God's creation, the gift of the new covenant that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, who has created the fruit of the vine. Lord, we thank you for these good gifts for us, your people. Lord, we thank you for the gifts of life and of sustenance but even more, we thank you for the gift of your son, for his death and resurrection, and for the new covenant that invites us in to the fellowship of your people. Lord, we pray that as we participate in this meal, Lord, that, that you would see grateful, joyful hearts, that we, we would be full of thanksgiving for the wonderful things that you have done for us and in us and through us. Pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read today from Luke chapter 22, the account of the Last Supper. Oh, wait, we're supposed to sing. I'm sorry. I will get this one day, guys. Let's join in together in singing the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> From Luke chapter 22, verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. My friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, a new covenant. You are invited to the Lord's table to remember, to celebrate, and to hope. Please come forward.
Let us stand together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.